All right, I'm going to review workshop 4.1, the calibration workshop in the steady flow class. We definitely recommend that you go try it yourself and work through it, but we'll walk you through the solution here and some thoughts about how we got to the published solution. If you want to get to this workshop, you can go to the steady flow RAS page under the HEC RAS training, or all of those workshops are also in here as tutorials. So if you went to guides and tutorials and you went to tutorials, 1D steady flow, we have lots of tutorials there, including the calibration workshop, and that's where we're, what we're going to work on. And so this is a workshop that is based on a calibration that I actually did with Gary Bruner several years ago of the Trinity River. And so let's take a look at the files. We're going to bring up the steady flow engine and run it. And it runs pretty quick. And then we're going to look at our profile. And what you really care about in the profile is you can kind of see these I'm zooming in now. You can kind of see these diamonds. These are the observed water surfaces. Uh, where we've actually defined those, if you go back to RAS, these end up in the steady flow editor. If you go to options, observed water surface, we have three flows with water surfaces here. And you know, at 7,000 CFS, we have more of these observed water surfaces, but we also have observed water surfaces at 4,500 and at a base flow. And some of these are offset. Some of them fall right on the cross section, but some of them are offset. They are not on the cross section, so they're shifted a little bit downstream, and that's what this number is. That's what shows up as these diamonds and we're mainly comparing the diamonds to the water surface elevation now there are times when it makes more sense for your calibrated flows to line up with your energy grade line which is the green line here um, and that's the case any case where you think that you know velocity head is going to turn into elevation head like at a bridge it's often more appropriate for your high water mark to line up with your energy grade line than your water surface but here we don't have a lot of obstructions we don't have any bridges and so in general we think that the water surface elevation is going to line up with the high water mark on um, when we're calibrated the other thing that's showing up here by default is our critical depth and that gives us some information. You can see this is a relatively steep reach. Uh, if I press control and I get my measuring tool, you'll see that you know our slope is 202, uh, which yeah, it's you know not as steep as it gets, but it's relatively steep. And you will notice that the water surface elevation is getting close to some of these critical depths at certain places. Uh, this is a riffle pool morphology. You can see that we've got some riffles and some pools. So the water is steep and then it's flat. Um, but for now, I'm just going to go in and I'm going to get rid of the critical depth and the energy grade line because those will be useful eventually, but we don't need them right now. Okay, so now we have three water surfaces and three sets of observed high water marks. And so the way that calibration progresses is that in general, you try to calibrate first to a bank full or a channel full flow, because that takes the complexity of the floodplains off the table, uh, but also really kind of focuses on a flow that you would care about. And then we'll go and look at how the higher and the lower flows play. But just looking at this, we can see that really we are below most of our observations. We're going to have to bring the end values up. Now, in the lecture, we talk about how there are multiple things that you might want to look at before you change your end values. The first thing is you want to make sure you're getting your hydraulic controls. What are those? Well, any of these high points, any of these ridges that would you know create a backwater like this, that's a hydraulic control. If you didn't have these two cross sections there, uh, you would be missing these points and you know. Raising your end value is really kind of a shoddy way to actually get that right. Also, if your flow goes through a constriction, uh, that could also be a hydraulic control. And if you miss that, you know, you'll know you have to raise your end values unrealistically to capture it. The other thing you want to make sure you get right is your ineffective flow areas. And I do ineffective flow areas before I do end values because they both affect your conveyance. And your ineffective flow areas, they're, they're actually a little less uncertain than your end values. And so you go through and you do those as well. But let's assume that we've done that we've done a good job and this is just what we've got and so we are going to have to raise our end values so what would be a good starting point well there's a few things we're going to go do to go estimate our end values we're going to go walk the river and obviously we can't walk the river on youtube but uh this is a gravel bed river with some pretty large material in there we've got some you know rough flow some high gradient reaches and 
if you look at the data we were given, we say that the average slope is about 2023, and the D84, which is the 84th percentile particle size, is around 80 millimeters. Happen to have a ruler here? That's eight centimeters. That's a pretty big particle. And so we're dealing with a gravel, you know, borderline cobble stream. Uh, and then the, main, the banks have these thick stands of trees and vegetation. And so there's gonna be high end value over there. And so we will walk the stream and you know, my opening offer would probably be somewhere around 0.04 to be honest, um, which is gonna be too high, which is another good illustration of a lot of times your intuition isn't right on these end values. And so you have to calibrate in order to get them right. And so what we can do is we can run two equations. The Limerinos equation is appropriate in this case because the roughness element, the large rocks, are what is accounting for the roughness, not the bed forms. And so, you, you know, the Limerinos is a function of what we call the relative roughness, the hydraulic radius, or essentially the depth, over the size of the material. And then this is also kind of a mountain stream, and so we can run Jarrett's equation. And the wild thing in this case is that Limerinos gives us a n value of 0 0.03, and Jarrett gives us an n value of 0 0.031. And that's about as close as those equations will ever come. So I think somewhere in between there is probably going to be a pretty good first estimate. And so let's go in and change our channel everywhere to 0 0.032. And at this point, what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn off my high and low profiles and really focus on that medium bank full profile. All right, so we're going to open our Manning's end value. We're not going to edit our end values here. That, that's too tedious. Uh, we're going to go to the table and open all of our Manning's end values. And you can see that, you know, we, again, we are doing the bank full flow because we want to focus on the channel. You know, there's a lot of uncertainty and obviously a lot going on in the floodplains here, but because of these high end values in the floodplains, we don't have a lot of conveyance over there. And so most of what's going on, most of what this model will be sensitive to is these channel end values. So let's isolate the channel end values. I'll go here and I'll say main channel only. And what that'll do is that'll collapse everything to these green cells, which correspond to the channel. And so you'll see that in general, we have this set at 0 0.02. No one would put this river at 0 0.02. This is artificially low in order to for you to have the workshop experience. But you'll notice that there are some places that are also 0 0.09. What's going on there? Well, if we go look at those cross sections, this is one of those cross sections right there. And if we zoom in, you know, the 0 0.02, it's a compound channel with a vegetated bar in between them. So I think we wanna leave that vegetated bar at the high end value and just change these 0.02s. So if we go back here, we want to just replace all of the 0.02s. So, you know, we, if we're just doing these, we could do a multiply factor, but we want to get these two. So we'll go in and we'll say replace 0.02 with 0.032 everywhere. And that'll go in and that makes 60 replacements. We'll say, okay, I'll run the model and that looks pretty good. That's not bad at all. Okay, but we don't have complete coverage with those high water marks. So which water surface are we going to look at next? Well, now we want to actually add the floodplain complexity. So we'll come in here and we'll go to profiles and we'll add the high flow. And you can see with the high flow that we're doing pretty well in this lower, lower gradient reach. But up here, we're kind of systemically low. Uh, we don't actually have much information about the moderate flow down there. But I think it'd be fair to conclude that we probably need a slightly larger end value up there. And so what we do here, and this is where we like to point out that you really don't change end values per cross section. You change them by morphological reach. And here, I think you can make a pretty compelling case that, the, that this reach at 0 0.0012 is kind of fundamentally different than this reach, which has a slope of you know, 0.0024. It's about double the slope. And so I could imagine these two being two different morphological reaches. So I'm gonna change the end values of this upper reach, and I'm gonna call the inflection point, this cross section 95.49. So I'll go in here and I'll open my end values again. 
and isolate them. Now I want to start at that 95.49, and I only want to change those. But I still want to leave these 0.09s, so I'm going to replace again, and I'm going to replace the 0 0.032 with, let's make that 0 0.036. But let's do the selected area instead of the entire table. And so you'll see that makes 28 replacements. It re only replaces those in that area I wanted to replace. And so now if I go back in and run, we're going to do better along that high reach. That's actually a pretty good calibration of the high flows. Okay, so let's now go in and look at the low flows. And so how are we doing with the low flows? Well, actually not bad at all. This would be a fine calibration. I don't mind this at all. I guess the one place we might have some flow variability is right here on this riffle. Uh, you could you could imagine increasing the flows on this riffle. Probably what's going on here is we haven't quite nailed the hydraulic control. We didn't really get this nail this riffle. And so we're actually not capturing those. But we could increase roughness a little bit at low flow through that reach. Now, in general, when I do flow roughness relationships, I tend to do them for the larger reach instead of just the riffle here. There isn't a lot of flow dependence in this river. And part of that is that it's a riffle pool system. You could get almost the same result from this river by just picking off these high points like that one and that one, really the riffles. And, you know, all of these points you almost could get by without. You don't want to, you know, there's some variability there, but really getting those riffles is the key to this. And you know, that really reduces the flow dependence. But let's actually just look at this reach right here. Let's say that between these two riffles uh, at 95.49 to 96.12, that we actually want to increase the roughness of low flow, but keep the roughness of the high flow. So what we'll do, is we're actually going to go to the geometry here. This is a plan level tool, um, but I usually think about it in the geometry. So we'll go to tools and then flow roughness factor. I'm going to add a reach. And as, as I said, we're going to go from you know, 96, 96.12 down to that 95.49. This is a little bit smaller than a, a, a reach that I would normally like to do this with, but we're just going to kind of demonstrate it. And so at the flow of 4500, which was our main calibration flow, we really like our calibration. So we're going to use a roughness factor of one because we don't want to multiply the end values by anything. And actually above that, we really like our calibration at our high flows too. So up to 7000 will give that a one as well. That means that anything above 4,500, above that you know, bank full flow, uh, you're gonna just use the end values that are specified. But for the lower flow down to say 450, at the lower flow, we're gonna bump the roughness by 20%. We're gonna say that in this reach, the roughness is gonna be 1.2. And so, and it will literally interpolate between those. And so then if I come back here and run it, now if we reload, we haven't actually changed this at all, um, but these are gonna be closer. And that's how you use the flow roughness factor. We could actually probably get away with increasing that a little bit more, but it also really doesn't matter much. That was just a demonstration of how to use the tool. As always, it's worth noting that uh, you don't want to over calibrate. All of these n values were pretty close to the range of n values that we computed or that we think is reasonable for this system. If I was to get up into like a 0.048, um, even a 0.045 in this system, I think I would start to ask myself some serious questions about is my flow realistic and how do I have some sort of structural error? You know, do I, am I missing ineffective flow areas? Uh, have I, have my cross sections missed hydraulic control? It's pretty common to see people try to compensate for structural errors in their model. The way they have set up the model, where they put their cross sections, where their ineffective flow areas are, they try to compensate for these things by just kind of reefing on their end value. And that's going to give you a model that's not going to reproduce reality in other flows. And so that's a little overview of you know, this calibration workshop and how we think about working through it.